an hour west of Seattle, 30,000 drivers pass through the small town of Gorst, Washington every day. They cross over Gorst Creek, a major source of king salmon in the area. Following the shoreline, many drivers will look out into the inlet to witness tribal fishermen using gill nets. My earliest memories of salmon fishing are of my grandpa and I dodging those same gill nets, only to return to the dock to see tribal anglers with totes full of salmon. So like many other recreational anglers, I was angered by the gill nets blocking Gorse Creek. But over a decade later, I now know the full story. Within the recreational community, there is a bias that does not like gill nets. The thought is that gill nets are terrible, terrible things. They, they really didn't want us out there fishing. I had guys shooting at me from, from land. I hear the bullets hitting around the boat. And it's a tough challenge for those that are younger. They've heard the stories now also. I grew up in the Puget Sound region after the fish wars in the 1960s. During that time, the state game department enforced regulations against tribal fishermen for harvesting dwindling salmon populations. But the result was a landmark decision which upheld the treaty signed by tribal and territory leaders in the 1850s. The Bolt decision in 1974 reaffirmed the tribal right for salmon harvest at their usual and accustomed fishing grounds. I'm a Squamish tribal member, elder. I'm the president of the fish committee for the Squamish tribe, vice president of the seafood company. And I'm also a commercial fisherman, been fishing for 54 years or something more in there. Yay, she runs! A lot of people don't know what a gill net is. We try to educate them, you know, as much as we can, but it's hard to get everybody's attention. This net here from the cork line to the lead line, it's uh, 240 meshes. It equals to about 1,800 feet, 120 feet deep. The cork line keeps the net floating and the lead line makes it go to the bottom. And all our fishermen really look forward to that king fishing because we're one of the few tribes that have king runs. When recreational fishermen see that, some of them get very upset. Yeah, we have a lot of trouble with uh, uneducated boaters. I was discouraged that salmon were on the decline and those gill nets were killing them before they had a chance to spawn in Gorse Creek. But then I had joined the Kitsap Poey Club and met Norm. He taught me that the salmon being caught are not wild fish and do not spawn in Gorse Creek. You don't need any Chinook salmon to enter Gorse Creek because there's no native run. There's lots of people that, once it's explained to them, they understand that there's a time and a place for nets, and Gorse Creek is a good one. The Kitsap Poe Club started a rearing facility around 1968 where they hand dug the very first pond they put those first fish into. The state provided the fish, the state provided the feed. The pogey club provided the labor to feed them and raise them and release them. And they did that quite successfully before the bolt decision had been decided and the Suquamish Nation came on board. Today, if it wasn't for hatcheries, we wouldn't have a fishery, plain and simple, nobody would. They're the only things that keep in any sort of commercial and sport fishery alive. Our tribe releases five million fish a year the rearing starts out at our Grover's facility, and that is where we get our brood stock. We collect the eggs and sperm there, and then we incubate them until they hatch. And then they get uh, loaded onto a tanker truck, and they get dropped over into our ponds. When we get the fish, they're about this long or so, and then when we release them, they're usually about that long. 
Typically at Gorst, we produce 1.8 million Chinook salmon annually. The purpose of the Gorst Rearing Ponds is to provide for the Suquamish Tribe commercial fisheries fleet. Our hatchery has done a lot as far as raising salmon for our fishermen. Our goal is to ensure tribal treaty rights, to ensure that we have fish that we can catch to provide livelihood for folks, and we purposely design it that way. Here at Gorst Creek, the trailer is an automated system for clipping and tagging salmon. The trailer does approximately seven to 8,000 fish an hour, and will do anywhere from 50 to 60,000 a day. By clipping our fish, we provide fish for sports fishermen to catch. The kings, we keep them here until about May, and then we release directly into Gorse Creek. They can swim all the way up to Alaska before they return as adults. Salmon are amazing creatures. It's resulted in a fishery that's benefited all fishermen. Three to four years later, they come back in, all the way from the ocean through the Straits of Juan de Fulca into St. Clair Inlet. Then you have the visuals. And there's many people that just will not accept the fact that a gill net is an acceptable way of killing a fish. I understand that to a degree. But what better way than to set up systems that can be harvested? It's happening. It's no different than someone with a herd of Hereford cattle raising them to make steaks. These fisheries, they can be designed in a way where they're focused on a hatchery stock specifically. Our Sinclair Inlet fishery is a really perfect example of that. I and mean, we feel good that we're just harvesting this hatchery Chinook population. Getting the message out that we're a fishery designed to enhance tribal treaty rights is really important. The Pogi Club has been working with the Squamish Nation since the 60s on this particular Chinook run. These fish are designed to be harvested 100%. So a fish trap is built, and that's what we're standing at, the fish trap. It's important to count the fish that get through the commercial fisheries. The Pogi Club help us collect science and process all these fish. Those numbers help us forecast what the upcoming years will be. So when it comes to negotiating who is gonna fish where, having as much data as we can helps. It's been a great partnership. We do make sure that those fish get out to the people that truly need protein on their table. Now when I see the nets out there, I see a tribal resource that is being shared openly with the community, including recreational anglers like me. All of my family participated in these fisheries. It's in their heart too. I mean, I mean, it kind of gets in your heart after you do it for so many years. You look forward to catching those fish. It just, it's just like breathing air. I don't work for myself anymore. I try to do everything for the seventh generation. I told the tribe, you know, I'm getting old and you guys need to pick up where I'm leaving off. I'm not going to be here forever. You know, I want to pass my knowledge down to the younger ones. I'm starting to pass my knowledge down to him. So you think I'll be doing this for a while? Oh yeah, as long as the water's still here, you know.